Hello and welcome to another episode of the Science on the Edge podcast series. I'm Dr Mark Darcy and in today's episode I'm going to be talking about the ethics of gene therapy and genetic engineering. This is kind of a follow-up to episode 8 of my Science on the Edge podcast series. In that episode, I went into the nitty-gritty of genetic engineering. I talked about things such as CRISPR and um, uh, retroviruses, liposomes, that sort of thing, and how genetic engineering is actually performed. Um, I briefly touched on the ethics of, of gene therapy and genetic engineering in that episode, but not not at great length. Um, if you want to know the details of um, the techniques involved in genetic engineering, then I, I suggest you, you go back to that episode, episode eight. But in this episode, which is a follow-up to that, I'm going to be focusing on the ethical implications of gene therapy and genetic engineering. Now, in recent years, um, the field of gene therapy and genetic engineering has has moved forward in leaps and bounds. New techniques such as CRISPR um, make gene therapy a much more a much more realistic um, medical intervention than it previously was. Um, and as we get even better at um, manipulating the genome, there are going to be a lot of medical procedures which will enter clinical settings that will allow previously untreatable diseases to be cured. Um, so diseases such as Huntington's disease, for example, which um, uh, kills its uh, sufferers at a very early age, um, early middle age, um, should be eradicated in, in just a matter of years and many other genetically inherited conditions too, such as um, sickle cell anemia, cystic fibrosis and many others. Um, and that's great. That is absolutely great. And I, I look forward to these diseases being eradicated. But the techniques that allow gene therapy to um, have its power will also be open to what some people might call abuse. Um, once we understand the various genes that are responsible for things such as um, intelligence, um, muscle mass, um, predispositions towards being musical or or mathematical, etc., etc. Once we understand all of those genes and those interactions, then gene therapy could be used in theory to manipulate such genes. And basically, I'm talking here about um, the concept of designer babies. Um, we could end up in a situation where people go to the equivalent of an IVF clinic in just a few decades and look at a menu and get the child that they would like rather than the child that nature would throw up at them randomly. Um, now, there's a lot of ethical issues around that. Is it is this good? Is it bad? Uh, where do we draw the line between manipulating the genome for purely medical reasons and manipulating the genome for aesthetic reasons, let's just say? And it's not as simple as we want a tall child or we want a child that doesn't suffer from Huntington's career. Um, there are much more subtle in between levels. What if your child is predicted to have just a very slightly below average IQ and you know that um, a simple gene manipulation would raise that IQ? Um, no many people would say, okay, um, that's, that's fine, that's ethical, I would raise a child's IQ to, to a normal level, but if that's possible, then surely most people would say, actually, um, if we're going to raise the child's IQ anyway, why not raise it substantially? Um, and that's when we enter a situation where where ethics really does need to play a role. Um, so what I'm going to do in this episode, the format of the episode, is going to be very similar to the last episode of Science on the Edge that I recorded. In the last episode, I discussed religion um, and atheism. And to do that, I basically um, had my followers, uh, my Twitter followers, get involved. So I basically wrote a tweet and... I asked my followers to, to tell me their feelings about atheism, about religion, deism, etc, etc. And they were quite forthcoming. I had quite a few responses and I read them out and discussed their responses in a podcast. And it was actually quite a popular episode. So um, I'm, I'm going to keep that same format today. So just before Christmas, I wrote a tweet 
um, I asked my followers the following. Hey guys, could you let me know your views on genetic engineering, gene therapy, and the upcoming techniques for engineering embryos? In light of the success of my last Science on the Edge podcast episode, I decided to record my next episode using the same tweet-based format. So that was the initial tweet that I released before Christmas. Um, I got quite a few responses. I'm not going to read them all out to you, but I'll read quite a few. Um, some um, were quite positive about the potential benefits of, of gene therapy. Uh, some were quite negative and some were, were sort of undecided. So let's get started. Um, I'm going to start by reading out a few tweets. Um, occasionally I will comment on those tweets. I hope you enjoy today's episode. So to get started, here's a tweet from Ian Quayle at Ian Quayle 6. Um, in principle, why not? But it seems to me that genotype phenotype interaction and epigenetics is one of the most complex areas of research. It would be so easy to make genetic changes with massive unintended consequences. Go slowly with supreme caution would be my approach. Um, I do understand where Ian is coming from here. Um, to just clarify a couple of those points, um, he states, um, it seems to me that genotype stroke phenotype interaction in epigenetics is one of the most complex areas of research. To just explain what that means, um, genotype is the sequence of your genes. So the sequence of bases that make up your genes. Phenotype is what results from the expression of those genes. So for example, you may have a sequence of bases um, in your genome that codes for um, eye colour. The phenotype might be blue eyes, green eyes, whatever. Uh, maybe you have some genes which have particular codes that produce certain proteins, that, um, and that's the genotype. Um, but the phenotype might be a change in height or a change in intelligence. So um, that is quite important because you might change a genotype and have an unpredictable um, phenotype resulting. So you alter a gene and you believe that altering that single gene will alter one particular protein that could result in, let's say, um, a reduction in the predisposition towards depression. But for all you know, that gene, when it produces a protein, that protein, the modified protein, interacts with various other proteins and actually causes some unintended consequence. Perhaps, yes, uh, the levels of depression go down in the patient, but perhaps the, um, the risk-taking behaviour um, increases, um, which can cause all sorts of problems, perhaps drug addiction in the future, for example. Um, and as for epigenetics, epigenetics, epigenetics refers to which genes are switched on or off at any one time. Now you can modify a gene all you want, but you don't necessarily um, know whether that gene will be active. Genes can be um, switched on, switched off, or switched on a little bit. So a gene to cause an effect needs to be expressed. The gene needs to be activated. We have 20 to 30,000 genes in our genome as humans. Um, they're not all switched on at the same time. The genes in a skin cell, the only genes within a skin cell that are switched on are the genes which make that cell behave as a skin cell. The genes that would make that cell behave as a heart cell or a neuron are not switched on. Um, so we selectively choose in our cells which genes are switched on and which genes are switched off. The term for this is epigenetics. Um, now, if you modify a gene, you don't necessarily know how that's going to affect the expression of the gene. There may be epigenetic consequences to manipulating the gene. Maybe it will become more active, maybe it will become less active. So Inquail makes a very good point here. We need to we need to be very sure what we're doing before we do it and that is the issue um for example there was an issue last year with a chinese scientist who manipulated um the genome of an embryo and 
He thought he knew what he was doing, but really it looks increasingly likely that he didn't. Um, that the gene therapy that he attempted to perform didn't actually work. Um, and um, the, the Chinese scientist in question has recently been sentenced to prison for this. So we need to be cautious, and I understand that. Okay, um, next reply was from um, Jan Erna, um, at Jan underscore E-A-R-N-E-Y. Um, years ago, one of my two pupils was diagnosed with juvenile Huntingdon's. Um, if she could have been spared that, but these advances are always a double-edged sword. The issue is how to ensure ethical use and restrict exploitation. Looking at history, I am not hopeful. Um, this kind of relates to the previous tweet, really. It's, it's, basically, um, it's basically prescribing caution. Um, and I understand where Jan is coming from here. Um, we need to be careful. Um, when a technology such as CRISPR, um, any gene therapy technology, um, becomes available, the temptation is to overuse it, to go straight into trying to use it um, to treat all sorts of conditions, both genuine and imagined. And if we don't, um, if we don't, don't apply a bit of caution, then perhaps there will be consequences um, down the road. I mean, luckily, the scientific process, and I think a lot of people in this Twitter thread don't understand this, but um, the scientific process is generally self-correcting. What happened in China was was unusual, and the guy went to prison for, for doing what he did. Um, scientists generally are cautious. We have to be. We, we lose our funding, we lose respect if we just rush into things, if we, if we make conclusions, if we perform experiments without all the necessary caution. Um, the peer review process will be very, very um, negative towards any scientist that doesn't, that doesn't respect the proper process, um, the proper scientific method. So I think caution is happening. Um, I mean, when someone comes up with an idea in science, but that initial for that initial idea to become something that's used in in a clinical setting on real patients and real humans can take decades. Um, and a lot of experiments are performed before before treatments become available to the public. So I understand the caution, but um, so do scientists. So maybe. Maybe the caution is slightly unwarranted, but I do understand where it's coming from. Um, I'm going to continue reading the tweets. I'm not really censoring these tweets at all because then it makes it look like I've got a bias on the subject. I'm really just reading them randomly. So now let's have a look at Elena. Um, <coughs> that's at H-E-L-E-N-E -E -E underscore S-W-C-P. Um, Okay, so um, Elena is basically um, providing a link to um, a book by Roger Plake, The Honest Broker. Um, I've not checked out that book myself, but it, it does, it does, um, uh, it basically hypothesizes a society um, where genetic engineering is, is a part of um, normal day-to-day -day procedures. Um, Okay, moving on to James Humphreys, at James B. Humphreys. Um, it is inevitable that this technology will be used. In combination with development of advanced AI, we will potentially have the ability to become post-human. If we don't do this, we are likely to become extinct as a species in the long run, um, as we will fail to adapt fast enough. Now... Oh, sorry, let me just close that box. I'm just reading from the screen as we go here. Um, okay, now I did reply to that. Um, I basically said to, to James, um, radical though that idea is, I totally agree, James, we either take the reins of our genome or we may face extinction. However, it's debatable whether the gene editing technologies or our understanding of genetics, epigenetics, is advanced enough yet to realize the potential. James responds, um, 
That's why we need AI to model genetic manipulation, which is beyond human intelligence at present. What matters is that haphazard evolution has somehow produced sentient life. We need to ensure sentience continues and not to be too precious about conserving our current fleshy shell. Um, now, this sort of attitude scares a lot of people, um, and I'm quite radical with, with my beliefs on this. Um, I don't think there's anything holy or precious about humans as we are now. A lot of people believe that if we start manipulating our genes, if we start genetically engineering our bodies or adding technology into our biology, integrating um, IT into, um, into our physiological processes, that we're somehow committing some, some sin, some evil, we're messing with nature. Um, that's not an attitude I, I subscribe to. I mean, we manipulate our genes all the time. Um, every generation, we choose who we marry, or at least many of us choose who we marry. Um, and by, by making that choice, we choose the genetic makeup of the offspring. They're a mixture of the two parents. So we perform a form of genetic engineering every generation, and we've been doing so um, since the dawn of time. Um, and nature, nature doesn't care. Nature doesn't give a damn about how happy we are, um, how pleasurable our lives are. It just cares about producing an another generation. Whatever makes you produce the most offspring is selected for. Whatever prevents that is selected against. We happen to have ended up in a situation where we are conscious and we understand to a limited degree science and nature. Um, and now that we have that knowledge, personally, I believe that we should use that knowledge to try and improve ourselves. Now, we need to be cautious because we don't understand our genetic makeup um, complete in, completely yet. Um, We've mapped the human genome to an extent, but we don't understand how all the genes interact with each other. We need more understanding before we start manipulating our genomes um, extensively. But personally, I believe when we do possess that understanding, manipulating our genomes might produce an improved species. We have many fault faults right now, many flaws. We we are destroying our planet. We have a lot of psychopaths. We have a lot of people that suffer from depression and anxiety. We have people with um, low IQs, um, with low empathy, all of these things. We have people that suffer all sorts of physical and mental ailments. And if we can produce a species that doesn't have those problems, I personally think that's a good thing if it's done properly and ethically. Um, I'll come back to that a little bit later, but I'm digressing. I should get back to reading the tweets. Okay, here is one from Neil Shirtcliffe, um, at N underscore Shirtcliffe. Um, my views are all over the place. Uh, CRISPR shows huge promise for engineering around problems that are of great relevance. It also has the potential to be used as a more intrusive version of the sex selection historically and currently abused in some places. Um, I believe that Neil here is referring to the one child policy that was um, present in China for some time. I believe that policy is ending now um, amongst other um, amongst other uh, political and moral ideologies. Um, yes, true, CRISPR has um, huge promise for uh, genetic engineering, um, but yeah, it can be abused. It can be abused. Even right now, there are people that, that choose the sex of their child in certain societies. They they perform IVF and they, they choose either a boy or a girl, um, and that can affect societies. If everyone picks one gender, then in the next generation, there's a shortage of the other gender. Um, and that's just sex selection. When you can start selecting for musical ability or predispos predispositions towards um, uh, towards depression, anxiety, um, or having an outgoing personality. 
uh, that could change that could change society radically in just a generation um let's see who's next um so king fish um at f w -E s h k w -E n g the current laws are populist reactionary nonsense that allows big business to do whatever they want no matter how unethical while gm advances that could save lives are banned because scientists can't afford lobbyists and teams of lawyers um uh, let's just see he goes on um uh, terminator seeds designed to allow um agribusiness monoliths to drive small farms out of business with no thought to the environmental consequences while children die needlessly in the millions due to vitamin enriched gm rice being banned hypocrisy that costs lives in that political climate, how can we expect new techniques to achieve the potential in benefiting humanity? Um, only by the voting public understanding GM, genetic modification, can we hope to use it fully for the common good. Um, well, I mean, I can't argue with any of that. Um, makes perfect, perfect sense. Um, this is a problem. Um, a lot of people are afraid of GM crops. I very briefly, um, years ago, worked um, at Monsanto um, in the UK. Not for long, actually. I was just a contractor. I was only there a few months. Um, in fact, the Monsanto branch eventually closed. This was the one in, in Cambridge in the UK. Um, I worked there very briefly. Um, and the problem is, when big business gets involved, you can have problems. Certain GM crops, I believe, are beneficial. Um, but there is a fear in the public about GM crops, a, a huge fear. And the fear is this. We are altering the genes of these crops. And as a result, by placing new genes into these crops, we're going to create monsters somehow. Or these genes are going to be passed on to humans and mutators in some way. And this fear, it, it basically comes from a lack of understanding. Um, look genes are transferred between organisms already in our mouths we have a number of different strains of bacteria we do in our gut as well and many of these different species of bacteria swap genes with each other this happens naturally within our genome we have viral dna that has become incorporated into our genome we have bacterial dna that has become incorporated into our genomes all the time species swap genes naturally it's part of nature it happens and it happens to a great extent randomly what we're doing with gm crops gm modification is we're choosing where to put these genes and how to add them it's a more controlled process and potentially it could be extremely beneficial however when big business gets involved which is is basically what this guy was saying um you can end up with pretty bad situation where you make crops that will will only survive for for one generation and cannot reproduce so the farm has to buy new seed from the manufacturer i mean that is gotta be wrong it's gotta be wrong um but my point here and i think this was this was his point too is that it's not the GM technology that's good or bad. It's the laws that govern it. If you let big business and money make all the decisions, then in many cases, the decisions are bad. They're bad for the population. They're bad for the world. Um, but there's no reason to throw out the baby with the bath water if we have technologies that can if used correctly save lives and feed populations then we shouldn't ban those technologies just because they're being misused by big business what we should do instead in my opinion you can see my bias on this topic um in my opinion, what we should be doing is coming up with sensible laws to govern the use of GM so that it is used to benefit people. Yes, to make some money as well, because that's how business works, but but in an ethical manner. OK, moving on. Let's see. Um, 
Charlene um, at Oceans1966. I can see where it could be useful as in eliminating certain hereditary diseases. However, I can also see the dark side. Insurance companies penalizing people for the risk of disease and a society where the rich manipulate their kids' DNA and the poor are even worse off than now. I mean, this is basically the Gattaca scenario. For any of you who've never seen the movie Gattaca, I um, I do recommend it wholeheartedly. It's a 1990s movie. I think it was 1996 or thereabouts. Very good movie. Um, Jude Law, Uma Thurman, brilliant movie. Um, it sets a few years um, from now, so in the near future, where everyone has the the genetic the um, genome sequenced at birth where we can manipulate genomes and where we live in a in an age where if you can afford it you end up with a child that has got everything going for it from birth low likelihood of certain diseases high likelihood of success um, and if you can't afford it you don't get that um, and the situation um, in Gattaca is such that um, if you have the wrong genome you don't get health insurance, you don't have access to certain jobs, certain professions. Um, it's a sort of mildly dystopian future where your genome is everything. It's a very good book, by, uh, sorry, very good movie, very entertaining. Um, but it's also very um, possible. Um, we could end up in a situation where, where um, it becomes standard that everyone's genome is sequenced at birth. We can all sequence our genomes right now. Um, I've had my genome sequenced. You can do it online. It's relatively cheap. When this becomes something, though, that every child has done, that part of your medical records, I can, you, I can understand how it could be open to abuse. It depends who's got access to this information, what they can do with it. Um, so yes, uh, we could end up in a situation where where we have two societies. Really, we have um, we have the people that have paid for gene therapies for the um, the children, who then have successful children that can outcompete the children of people that have not been genetically edited. Um, two societies: a society of natural people that have got um, good things going for them bad things going for them they have genes that benefit them and genes that do not benefit them and then we have the other uh, society the other division the people that are well let's let's not say perfect but that are just less prone to all of the negative consequences that most of most of us have had nature throw in our direction uh, that could happen that is a real worry um that's all down to legislation isn't it it's really down to legislation um okay so unrepentant avenger um at unrepentant ave1 genetic engineering and gene therapy to eliminate illness or hereditary issues used for good not for the sake of making a can union sing um so referring to um referring to star trek there um khan genetically engineered superman who's also super evil um this is kind of a, a worry a lot of people have if we create these genetically engineered children they will turn out to be these evil super villains who will start wars and try to take over the world well maybe um, but if you know enough about genetic engineering, then presumably you would not choose to create children that are evil psychopaths that want to take over the world. Again, it's all about knowledge and it's all about ethics. Um, if we know what every gene does and how the, how the products interact with each other in the human genome um, and environment, because obviously we're not just about our genes, environmental influences have an effect as well. Um, most current um, most current studies um, seem to point to the fact that about half of what we are is down to our genetic makeup and about half our upbringing. So it's not just the genes. The genes give you a predisposition, but it needs to be nurtured in the right way by a, a positive environment as well. Um, but the point is, 
yes, we could produce um, super intelligent, super evil narcissists um, if we uh, if we manipulate the genome in the wrong way. But equally, we could produce super empathic, super intelligent um, pacifists that just want to make the world a better place. It's all about how it's done. It's all about the ethics of it, what laws are put into place. Um, when we know which genes, well, we, when we know which genes are involved in things such as psychopathy, um, and we know that if you manipulate a certain gene in a certain way, you increase the likelihood of, of narcissism and all that kind of thing, then we just need to put laws in place saying, don't manipulate those genes in that way. Simple as. Um, okay moving on um so we've got here quite a long name uh uh laz husband of rachel destroyer of worlds at lazar what is the address at lazar l-a-z-a-r-o-u-m-t-e-r-r-o-r Ah, okay. Um, either everyone has access to this technology um, and it's regulated or the rich will speciate off from the rest of us and we'll be in Morlock Eloy territory. So referring to H.G. Wells' The Time Machine. Um, I'm sure you've all seen The Time Machine. Um, Victorian guy goes into the distant future in a time machine that he built and the society is divided into two the morlocks and the eloi um genetically divergent species each very different from each other the morlocks preying on the eloi for food um i'm not suggesting that's what the future will be like but we could easily end up in in a situation in the future where there are the natural humans as i mentioned previously that are not genetically engineered and the engineered humans which by definition would be the ones who had rich parents because it will probably cost money to perform genetic engineering on your children um and that's an issue if this technology is only available to the rich then the rich will use it create children that are healthier more long-lived less prone to disease etc 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 more intelligent and the poor want and that will divide society at the moment we have the rich and the poor um and money is not distributed evenly rights are not distributed evenly on this planet and that's a bad thing it's a very bad thing um but even in our current societies there's always a potential if you're poor to make it to the top because when all is said and done genetically we're all pretty much the same um the brain of someone born in, in a poor family in a poor part of the world um genetically is is the same as that of a brain of, of someone born in a rich family in a rich part of the world so if that poor person is lucky um if they make the right decisions if they try hard they can maybe crawl their way out of the of the poor upbringing and end up in in a successful place where where they have everything that the rich people have you can basically migrate um, social migration is possible it's harder in some societies than others it's quite difficult in the us at the moment for example but social migration is possible um now in a future where genetic engineering becomes commonplace and it's uh, used by the rich social migration could become impossible i mean at the moment we're all the same physically it's just opportunities that differ when we enter a situation where the rich people have children that are superior they they just are they are more intelligent they are harder working for for genetic reasons they are less prone to disease etc and they live longer well they're going to put themselves in an unassailable position and these poor natural people that are born with nothing they just wouldn't be able to compete the iq the physical health would just not be up to the challenge of competing with the children of the rich um and that's a real scary situation um personally the way i view this is that 
genetic engineering, gene therapy needs to be available to everyone if it's available to anyone. Um, at first, when gene therapy becomes available, it will be used just to um, edit genes that make people prone to certain genetically genetically inherited conditions, such as cystic fibrosis, Huntington's disease, um, and um, uh, sickle cell anemia. And that's great. Um, and everyone would approve of that, I'm sure. But straight away, you end up in a situation where people from rich families have children but don't have any of those genetic genetically inherited diseases whereas people from poor families still do have an incidence of these diseases um that's where it would start and then as we start to engineer more and more of our genome and start playing with things like iq and general health and longevity we get speciation we get a separation of humanity into two species and the only way that that can be prevented is if we make the gene therapy available to everyone you might say that's just not going to happen because it's going to cost money i don't know i don't have an answer i'm not a politician um but it certainly needs to be regulated in a way where where it's not something that only the rich have access to because if so then then yes, um, he's right. We could end up in Morlock Eloy territory, sort of. Okay, so um, Ovidiu, um, let's just get that name. So um, at P L O U N T underscore O S. Um, so first, he, um, first he said, um, "Can I not have an opinion about things that I don't really understand?" um i sent him a couple of links then and he, he did he did read through those links um and basically he came with a couple of comments um so for example um uh let's see um self-terminating mosquitoes he has a few thoughts on those um so this is referring to the idea that we we can engineer mosquitoes that that die young that die young um and as a result do not live long enough to contract and pass on um <coughs> the plasmodium uh, parasite that causes uh, malaria um and his comments self um terminating mosquitoes for example i do not like don't get me wrong i passionately hate mosquitoes but i know that they are an important part of the ecosystem especially the lava um yes i mean that that is true um this is, this is basically referring to a bunch of experiments that have been performed recently to try and engineer mosquitoes to die young to try and reduce the incidence of malaria the idea is you breathe these mosquitoes you release them into the environment and the rates of malaria go down sounds great in theory but um mosquito is part of the ecosystem we don't know every interaction that mosquitoes have with other insects and other aspects of the environment that, that they live in. And if we produce mosquitoes that die young, yes, perhaps we will reduce the incidence of, um, of malaria. But perhaps some other problem will arise because of this. I'm not saying what that problem is. I don't know what that problem is, but... The ecosystem is quite complex. Lots of animals, lots of insects, lots of plants interact with each other in very complex ways that we don't fully understand. Um, this goes back to my original point. Um, if you're going to perform genetic engineering, you need to do it with caution. You need to know what you're doing. Um, okay, moving on. Um, so... Um, Ayrton Evans, uh, let's get his Twitter handle, um, that's at A-Y-R-T-O-N-E-V-A-N-S underscore. Um, for me, it's an issue of freedom. Let people do whatever they want so long as they're not hurting anybody else. We're entering the age of transhumanism where the impossible becomes a reality. Um, yeah um an age with huge potential although it does need to be managed 
appropriately. Um, transhumanism is a, is a fascinating idea um, and one that a lot of people um, fear. Um, but remember, we evolve. There's this idea that messing with humanity is an evil thing because we are what we are. As if we've always been like this. We haven't always been like this. The humans of today, probably genetically, are very different than the ones that existed during the Ice Age. Yes, we were looked the same outwardly, but I bet our genome was very different. Well, subtly different, because the environment was different. And if we just go back a couple of hundred thousand years, we weren't humans. Um, we'd not yet evolved. We were at a pre-human stage, let's just say. Um... Animals evolve, plants evolve, things change, existence is about to change, life is about to change. There is no pure thing called a human that has remained unaltered since its initial formation. That's a myth. We are constantly changing. The humans that first came into Europe approximately 70,000 years ago of all the recent Recent evidence shows that it may be a little bit before then, but um, the, the point is that the first humans that came into, into Europe um, were not white. They were black. Um, we changed because the environment was different. Um, the first people to enter Asia didn't have epicanthic folds around their eyes. They didn't look Asian. Um, people change. People evolve. We've evolved in the last few thousand years and will continue to do so who knows what a if, if left to to nature what humans would look like in, a, in another hundred thousand years if we would even be humans then um transhumanism is just the idea that we we help that process along we direct it at the moment evolution is something that just happens to us we have no choice in the matter really uh, we don't know where we're going to be in a few hundred thousand years it will depend on the environment it will depend on natural selection um, the idea of genetic engineering and transhumanism is that we take the reins rather than just letting the horse run wherever it wants we sit on its back we hold the reins and we pick a direction um, and that scares a lot of people, but I don't think it should do. As long as we pick the right direction, what is the arm? It could benefit us hugely. We could increase our longevity, our health, our IQ, our empathy, our musical ability, everything. If it's done correctly. Which is why, which is why I believe genetic engineering is not just inevitable, but will ultimately be beneficial if the politics is right if the regulatory processes are right if we have the right laws in process in in place whether that will happen or not i don't know and time will tell we're right at the beginning of this process so it's it's hard to be sure right now okay so i'm um, kevin g Bacchus, um at kevin b-e-a-c-h-u-s there are pros and cons for this sort of stuff. My very limited knowledge of it does not allow me to comment. It does scare me that folk are tinkering with our genetic codes without fully declaring what they are up to or hoping to achieve. Again, this is about regulation. Um, and it is a real fear. The guy in China, the scientist in China, who tried to manipulate the genome of an embryo so that the um the, the child would not be susceptible to infection by hiv um i mean that's that's scary because we're not really at the stage where we should be manip manipulating genomes in that sort of way we don't know enough about them and it doesn't even look like it worked in this particular case um but what should make us feel positive about this is that even in china um were let's just say um ethics and always involved in science and, and always involved when it comes to dealing with the public even in that country this scientist was arrested and imprisoned for what he did um so that gives me hope that does give me hope um martin avery um at martin a six five six eight four three seven two
We've been accidentally messing with genes ever since medicine and agriculture were invented. I suspect gene editing might be the only way to undo the damage we've already done. Um, perhaps, good point, good point. Um, Heather Newby, Hat Hedge Newby. Um, I think you know how to spell that. Um, I'm in a state of indecision. I think it's amazing that we can do these things, but at the same time, the fact that we can scares me to death. Well, that's just natural. That's fear of the unknown. Um, uh, when you don't understand the technology, it can appear scary. And that's understandable. That's understandable. Um, let's see. Moving on. Zoya Ali. Um, so... A at A Y E S H A A L I underscore three. It's still so experimental. I recently watched Unnatural Selection and the insight into biohacking was alarming. The technology needs to be applied in a regulated fashion. By having it put in the public domain in an unregulated fashion, it will only set back future development. I mean, it will be regulated. It certainly won't. It, it certainly certainly won't be available in an unregulated. Um, fashion. Um, I mean, every drug we use is, is regulated in some sort of way. Um, so gene therapy certainly will be, certainly will be. Uh, whether it's regulated in a good way or a bad way, that remains to be seen, but it will certainly be regulated, certainly be regulated. Okay, um, Edushkai Beltranova. I'm sure I'm pronouncing that incorrectly. If you're listening to me, <laughs> sorry. Um, at e d u b e l t r a n e d u. Um, totally agree. As long as it's for the purpose of fighting hereditary illnesses, and that's the first purpose it will be used for. I would say there are so many hereditary illnesses. Um, they could be eradicated very easily, very easily. Um. And I think, personally, there are, there's no ethical implications for that, really. I mean, hereditary diseases should be eradicated. They should be. Um, and pretty soon they'll be able to be eradicated. Um, let's see. So here we have... Um, at Bill B J six, um, I feel I don't know enough to hold an opinion. Is it wise, compassionate, kind, and disadvantages no sentient being would be my aim? Concern over destabilizing ecosystems? Question mark. Yep, a point I've touched on earlier. Um, Michael, uh, topic at tropical on a tour. Um, as a species, we lack the wisdom and quality of thought to use such a technology wholly benignly. There's also no gene for improving wisdom and quality of thought. Some of the brightest people hold extremely poor ideas as their most precious fundamental beliefs. Um, okay, good point. Good point. Very well made. Um, Lorna at star S. M U R F seven seven. How much will we will we lose from all the autistic people who won't be born? What about deaf people? They're not disabled. They're a linguistic and cultural group. Those of us with genetic conditions will lose treatments because there won't be any point in researching them. And there's a lot. Um, yes, I understand that point. I. I do, do understand that point um certainly thought provoking um uh, joan o'brien uh, replies to that point actually that's at um j-o-a-n-i-e-n-i-b-h-r-i-a-n -E -I, -I, um, I agree with testing for abnormalities the parents should have the right to decide if they can cope with a difficult result um, my daughter has three small ones, add all the tests, some not standard, just to be prepared. It's parents who are left holding the baby, holding the baby in quotation marks. Yes, I, I, do, I do get that. I understand if you're, if you're born with a disability of some sort. Um, so if, if any of people listening to this podcast have um, a disability um, of any kind, then 
they may fear genetic engineering they may fear that people like them would just not be born um um or would be modified in some way um if genetic engineering was currently available um that's possible that that is quite possible um but I, I I do understand the response to that as well. It's difficult. I mean, this is a decision I've had to think about myself, my myself and and my other half. Where you know we're trying for children, and um, we are going to get all the tests done uh, when and if she becomes pregnant, and then we'll have some serious decisions to make. Um, I I don't I don't speak as someone who doesn't understand this at all. By the way, um, I should say that my my sister is severely mentally handicapped um she's um she's in her 30s but she has a mental age of a three-year-old really um and her life has been incredibly difficult because of that incredibly difficult um she's not really had much of a life to be absolutely honest um on top of which just a, a year or so ago she was diagnosed with breast cancer caused by a faulty gene the BRCA gene which predisposes people to being to, to to developing certain forms of breast cancer so she's not been dealt a good hand of cards and I, I by pure chance was not dealt the same hand i mean i'm my iq is reasonable um and i've i've been tested for the BRCA mutation i don't have that mutation so I'll, i won't be passing that on breast cancer is unlikely in, in my children um and that's just luck that is just blind luck if we can if we could have prevented my sister from from developing um the various conditions she's had just through genetic screening and some genetic engineering then that would surely be a good thing but i understand what lorna is saying um if you're deaf for example i mean is is that really a is it really a disability some people don't consider it a disability they consider it just part of who they are um and i understand that and that's why we need to debate these topics we need to debate how genetic engineering is used it's a very personal thing in many cases okay right um moving on uh, i'm at cuff daddy k-o-u-f-d-a-d-d-y um i am ambivalent at best gene therapy when used to combat rare illnesses is good uh, run of the mill illnesses like a cold not sure since i'm of the belief what doesn't kill you makes you stronger when it comes to embryos i believe it is a disaster waiting to happen um at um m e g n i c o l 2 who will decide where the line is drawn i look to history and see how lives have been changed through research for the better then I think of past patients I nursed who had a lobotomy in the 1950s, and I conclude that not all research has a positive effect. That's a very good example, actually. All those lobotomies that were performed that basically ruined people's lives. And they were done for good reason. And people thought when they were performing lobotomies that they were helping people. And they were wrong. They were wrong. Um, I would hope that the regulatory processes that we have in place today are better than the ones we had in the 1950s though and that they will continue to improve um that's not guaranteed but i, I would hope so okay now uh, here's a, 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 tw a tweet um fred that um, i've been looking forward to getting to actually um this is from a um a genetic engineer um dr emma hilton um let me just get that twitter handle at f-o-n-d-o-f-b-e-e-t-l-e-s fond of beetles um i use crispr tech to engineer non-human genomes my aim is usually to create disease causing mutations to study the effect on the animal rather than correct them um I know that while I often successfully hit my target gene, I have no way of testing how many other hits I've made. One can aim for specificity, but not guarantee it. I overcome this by outbreeding my engineered animals to minimize the effects of off-target hits. Obviously, you can't do this with human embryos. If there uh, was a well-tested CRISPR strategy for a specific disease mutation that could be shown to be specific for that mutation, I'd be comfortable treating embryos 
for serious diseases. Ash continues, um, I would, however, question how genome engineering fits alongside screening selection. If you carry a serious disease, you can opt for IVF and screening of embryos, so only healthy ones are implanted. I assume the remainder are destroyed. Um, does genome engineering really reduce the overall ethical load of the process of ensuring a healthy embryo? If you are willing to consent to genome engineering of an embryo, you are perhaps also the mindset willing to consent to screening selection. And the screening selection method strikes me as currently being less risky. In terms of treating later onset disease um, in limited regions of the body, Dushan, for example, um, no ethical problem whatsoever. Um, okay, so reply to this from, um, let me get this right, at PHV underscore M-E-N-T-A-R-C-H. Um, also, the necessary step of dilution limit cloning involved in the process causes various epigenetic changes and or mutations. Hence, the clone one ends up using for expansion, implementation, likely carries more unknown genomic modifications. Um, Emma replies to this, and while we can fairly quickly sequence genomes, sifting through the data to try and work out whether you've induced off-target effects, basically manipulating genes you didn't intend to manipulate, at any point in the process takes far longer. Um, PHV replies, uh, yep, um, thus rendering way too costly money and time, if not moot, the use of this approach to correct a disease-causing mutated gene in pre-implantation embryos. Uh, I replied to this, um, uh, I basically commented on the Chinese scientist, the recent incident with a Chinese scientist atten attempting to alter the susceptibility of an embryo to HIV infection has, has certainly raised a lot of questions regarding the ethics of gene editing, although from what I've heard, it seems that this experiment didn't actually succeed anyway. And PHV replies, uh, yeah, and on this aspect, we need to preemptively come up with strict ethical principles in the application of tech such as CRISPR to humans. How fast we acted with regards to human cloning comes to mind here. That's true, that's true. When we first um, cloned, well, when, when we basically first cloned Dolly the sheep, first mammal to be cloned back in the 90s, um, we immediately um, came up with regulations to prevent humans from being cloned. Um, so yeah, regulations should occur quickly. I, there's no doubt about that. Um, I continue. Um, alas, a lot of what we do in um, in the lab probably has off-target epigenetic effects. If the stress levels of an organism can influence gene regulation, and they do, um, so drastically, then gene editing technologies, especially the old school ones, such as lipofectamine and electroporation, which I won't go into right now, certainly can. Um, PHV replies, um, uh, yep, all of this means though is we simply must strive onward to eventually discover, come up with an error-proof approach of gene therapy. And I agree, we, we certainly should. Um, we don't have uh, perfect techniques just yet. There's a lot of flaws with the genetic, with the, with the gene editing technologies that we currently have. Um, however, those technologies are are improving. They are improving quite a bit. Um, CRISPR is the best we have at the moment, um, but new technologies are under development um, and they will make CRISPR look terrible by comparison. They really will. Um, and that will give us more power though. When the new techniques come online, we'll be able to be far more specific as to, as to what we um, you know, how accurate the gene therapy is and um, how exactly we alter genes. Okay, so moving on. Um, let's see. Uh, okay, so um, at not underscore really underscore JT. I don't think I need to spell that for you. Um, okay, so on one hand, I'd love to prevent future children from needing regular colonoscopies like me, um, but as someone on the spectrum, I have some obvious concerns. Gene editing will happen though. 
So it's better that we sort out the ethics than argue broadly for or against it. Um, yeah, I mean, that's that's very clear and very true. Um, it will happen. It will happen. I mean, we're, we're arguing now as to as to the ethics of, of performing gene editing, of changing people's genomes. But that's not really the question because it will happen when the technology becomes available and it becomes cheap enough. It will be used somewhere on this planet, even if it's just in clinics solving Cuba or somewhere. Um, it's going to happen. It's going to be used. So what we really need to do is to sort out the ethics right now before it becomes available. The ethics should come first. We need the legislation. We need the laws. We need international agreements to determine the ethics of when and how gene therapy can be implemented. We need to do that before we start to perform gene editing. I completely agree with him on this point. Okay, um, Amanda Snook at um, V-A-N-D-A-S-N double OK one. Like the internet, it will be wonderful and horrifying depending on who's using it. Good and evil forces will fight over the control of it, and the outcome of this fight will be a judgment on the human race. I like that. I, I do like that. Um, the internet, when it was first created, held huge, huge potential, still does, and many people believe that it would create a utopia, this borderless society this borderless world that we could all enter at our will where there were no rules no laws and we could all just share our ideas and our thoughts and it would be a utopia genuinely people thought this back in the 1980s um we all know what happened with the internet um it's got a lot of good stuff on it it's got a lot of bad stuff on it um and yeah you need regulation to ensure that the good stuff dominates. Um, genetic engineering holds huge potential, needs to be regulated correctly though. I mean, there's a reply to this particular point from Nigel Tolley at uh, D Discrete Secure. At Discrete Secure. Um, is it going to be controllable though? There will be backroom clinics for this stuff fairly soon, whether here or abroad. The point I just made, I believe. Uh, the one restraint is probably that women won't put up with this bullshit, but not every woman gets a say. Preferences for gender, etc. will become set in stone. Very true. Um, Cordelia Bracht um, at S-T-A-N-G-Y-A. -A. Um... Now, this one uh, may offend a couple of people, but what the heck? Um, I want to engineer a virus that renders humanity 90 to 100% sterile so we can leave this planet with some dignity before we kill every single species that habits this earth. So many idiots reproducing. Let them fuck their brains out instead. Okay. <laughs> I said I'd read out all the tweets, or at least um, a, a sizable representation of them, and this certainly is one of those. I mean, radical, but I understand the sentiment. Um, we've done a lot of damage to this planet. We really have, especially over the last century, climate change being the biggest example. Um, but yes, um, I don't think destroying our species is necessarily the way to save the planet. Educating our species, improving our species is. But I understand the sentiment. Humans... Humans have done a lot of harm to this planet, a lot of harm. Um, but I don't think giving up as a species is necessarily the solution. Um, okay, so moving on. Um, Nicola O. Riordan Finley. Um, and the Twitter handle is at uh, Golda312. Um, when we did what we did as the human race is decide that we should control the living earth in doing so we could create a greater monster than the one that we face in climate change at this moment nature still has a chance to level the playing field with famine and illness with genetics this is gone um perhaps perhaps not um i don't think we would make ourselves invulnerable 
to illness and famine um, with genetic engineering. We might improve uh, survival rates and our health, but I don't think we'd make ourselves totally immune. Um, okay, so um, at Gail Marie 1958, will we be entering an ethics nightmare? There will be those engineering the perfect baby human, especially for those that can pay. It's new science in a lot of ways, and there will be those that abuse it, and we don't know what the consequences will be. We don't. I mean, we didn't know what the consequences of um, splitting the atom would be back in the 1940s. Um, we still don't know what the consequences of space exploration will be. Um, time will tell. Just though, just because we're, we don't know something, we don't know the consequences of an action, though, is, is no reason not to explore the issue. We just need to tread carefully, in my opinion. Uh, Nicola O'Riordan Finley um, at Golda 312. There are pros and cons um, to genetic engineering. Um, it will stop people like me from having type 2 diabetes, but if not regulated properly, it will also allow parents to do sex, height, colouring, etc., and that's playing God. While we are on that, what right do we have to engineer life? Uh, what right does nature do for that matter? Um, what right does nature have to engineer life? Um, okay, um, Debbie Kennedy at Kennedy 22 Debbie. My MSc genomic medicine class was asked whether we each would have full exome DNA profile, um, i.e. clinical implications known but don't always have treatment available. Class was divided 50-50 on whether they wanted this. Um, at actual kahuna, I think it can be used for good, i.e. making people more empathetic and smarter. However, it is important that everyone who wants to get to use this, else we get a caste system with an inbuilt injustice. That's true. Um, caste system I kind of mentioned earlier on, we could end up with a caste system. People with different genetic makeups, different access to gene therapies, effectively being different classes of human being with different different rights, different types of jobs available to them, etc., etc. Um, that is a fair point, which I made previously, but it's still a very, very good point. Um, um, at Darren WS77, it scares me. Uh, sort of the way AI does. I feel like it's an amazing advancement, but I don't trust the powers that be to not try to use um, use it for nefarious purposes, i.e. super soldiers, master races, etc. Yes, that is the real fear, isn't it? And it's all about the legislation. You can imagine if, if strongly right-wing governments end up in power, this could be used in a very unethical way. Um, uh, we need more liberal governments to to legislate this technology um otherwise it just won't be available for everyone and that's when we do end up in a situation perhaps where we have a caste system genetic caste system um okay so at um catherine russ seven recombinant technology that basically means um gene editing technology has produced some useful and effective therapies which could not be produced by other means or produced with difficulty Gene therapy has tremendous potential for treating some devastating inherited conditions. Let's not forget this. Um, it's tempting when discussing genetic engineering, if you're, if you're healthy, to just think about all of the negative impacts, about designer babies, about super soldiers, about a genetic caste system and all of this. But let's not forget that there are many, many genetically inherited conditions. There are lots of faulty genes which we all possess to one degree or another that make us more or less prone to developing certain conditions. If you have a particular version of, of a, a gene, the APOI4 gene, for example, um, uh, allele, um, then you're more likely to get um, Alzheimer's disease as you get older. We could remove that. Um, if you have certain BRCA gene mutations, you're more likely to get breast cancer. We could remove that. Um, many 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 conditions that we suffer from um which we don't we don't consciously think um are a result of um our genetics are um if you're born with a certain genetic makeup you're more likely to get 
um, high blood pressure, heart disease, stroke, diabetes, all sorts of conditions, macular degeneration, and all of these conditions could, in theory, be prevented with gene therapy. It's not just about creating super soldiers. It's not just about creating designer babies. It's about, it's about reducing suffering. It's about getting rid of devastating diseases and conditions. And I personally think that's a great thing. We need to regulate to prevent the bad uses of gene therapy from becoming dominant, but we need gene therapy. We need it. It's it's going to be as, as big a breakthrough when it fully matures as, as antibiotics were, or sanitation for that matter. Okay, right, so um let's move on um <laughs> um so this is from at um vt win gator um i just worry that in something like viral therapy that the potential for misinsertion i.e into an oncogene or a critical promoter sequence somewhere is quite high um uh, what they're basically referring to here is that if we if we try to perform genetic engineering and we're not accurate with it, um, if a gene ends up being inserted in the wrong part of the genome, it can actually cause disease. And that's true. But that isn't an argument against genetic engineering. That's an argument for making genetic engineering more specific and more accurate, which is something that is is currently being investigated. Um, uh, Duncan Giddens at Duncan Giddens. Um, the science exists and technology is developing, so most of the debate needs to be about how both are regulated. A lot of research is on an open basis. Need to learn lessons from lack of effective regulation of the internet. It's too fundamental to be left to private sector market. Yeah, agreed. Totally agree. <laughs> Can't say a bad thing about that tweet. Um, at God needs a shave. I do like that Twitter handle. Um, <laughs> uh, therapy sounds better than engineering, um, but no one size fits all cases. I would construct an ethical matrix or map with all interested parties represented. This may help identify key issues and provide a framework for discussing principles of access acceptability and morality. Um, at Dr. Dobson, I do work on industrial biotech um, and use CRISPR for yeast development. That's yeast um, genetic engineering. It does let us do crude changes, but the overall effects include systemic change that is not predictable, e.g. reduced stress resistance. I think we are still 20 years off editing humans in a sound way. Um, it continues. And also, we barely understand epigenetics. Remember, that is how genes are switched on and off, how they're expressed. The effects of future environments on human development could be important. Nevertheless, you are right to worry and to raise this prospect. Regulation will not stop the rich trying to make themselves superhuman. Of course it won't. Of course it won't. As soon as this technology is available, and as soon as we have the ability to improve strength, health, vitality, intelligence, it's going to be used by someone. The only way to manage this process is to regulate it effectively, to have international agreements. I've said this previously, but that's what we need. We need this topic to be discussed at the highest level internationally. It's as important as climate change in many ways. Okay, um, Jane, um, at JAMG3916, short and sweet, scurry as the implications are far and wide. It is indeed. Um, at Mike D. Brook, where is the debate with decision makers? I get the impression we are pretty much a free-for-all. If it can be done, it will be done. Um, we don't have a free-for-all. It's, this is, it's not a free-for-all. It isn't a free-for-all, Mike, but, um, but we certainly need more regulation. Um, at catch a minute, yes, correcting genetic diseases, no to manipulating DNA for extraordinary genetic advantage. But that's a statement that is up for interpretation. How do you define extraordinary? Um, average IQ is 100. Um, if you are told that your embryo is going to have an IQ of 90, um, 
which is within the average range, really. I mean, 100 is average. 90 to 110 is within the average range. Um, should you be able to choose to have your child of, of an IQ of 90, have its IQ raised to 100? Is that extraordinary? 110, is that extraordinary? 120, 130, 140, when does it become extraordinary? There's a lot of gray areas, basically. Um, at um, P-H-I-L-O-S-O 23431938. Um, as a non-expert, I find the subject fascinating but highly contentious. My concern is I don't trust the people with the ultimate power to decide how it gets used. Bright people are developing great things that powerful people use to gain advantage. It's a very slippery slope. That's a very good point. The people that are de developing these technologies are clever people. They are smart. The people that are in control of deciding how these technologies are used are not necessarily the smartest people. Our top politicians are not the brightest. They're not. Some are very smart. Many are not. They're just, they're just populists. They're people that have just ended up in the position they've had by a combination of luck and connections. And they're the people that make the laws. It's not the smartest people that make these decisions that regulate such technologies. It's not always the smartest people. In many cases, it's, it's a bunch of narcissists, and that's a worry. That is a worry. Scientists and ethicists need to be part of this decision-making process. It can't just be narcissistic, self-interested, self-obsessed. I know all those things mean the same thing. <laughs> it can't be those type of politicians that make these decisions. Um, okay, uh, moving on. Um, at Morad Guy, um, the obvious benefits uh, are talked about a lot, so they should be. But what's eventually going to happen is, despite the best intentions from Western policymakers, are that gene editing will thrive as a private market in areas with less regulation, um, e.g. East Europe. Um, he continues, and as such, those that can afford will manipulate children's genes, including using biotech on themselves until they become a separate species. Homo sapiens will go extinct because they can't afford to adapt. This is all obvious in the case that we solve the climate crisis. Okay, let's sort of get a little bit out of that. Um, yes, um, if the private sector becomes dominant in this area and is poorly regulated, then there is the potential for abuse. A point that's been made, I think, by a lot of people. A lot of people. Um, at um, Bobo, Bob old punk all for it if it can lead to a cure for that evil disease cancer which it may well by the way but would hate it to fall into some extreme far-right group like the nazis or even worse a political party who despises poor people true this can't be about class it needs to be about ethics um so at warlord underscore ov underscore mars what matters is can we cure dying of old age and disease however if we can do it should we do it well this is kind of a, my area in a way um aging longevity cellular senescence uh kind of my topics um but I've given a whole podcast, uh, several podcasts, uh, where I discuss um, ageing and longevity, but I will answer this point. Um, genetic engineering, I don't think, would end ageing as such, because ageing is such a complex process. Um, but genetic engineering could certainly extend longevity, potentially by centuries, and reduce the incidence of many of the diseases associated with old age. So yes, gene therapy, in theory, could uh, create a species that, that goes on for centuries, centuries, um, which again, has many separate ethical issues associated with it. Um, but yes, gene therapy will probably extend longevity, and I'm all for that. Um, 
Aging, in my opinion, is a disease, a series of diseases that are partly genetic, and we need to do something about that. As for becoming immortal, I don't think gene, gene therapy on its own will make our species immortal. Um, but gene therapy, together with other technologies such as stem cell, uh, stem cells, um, and uh, perhaps. <clears throat> Perhaps nanotechnology could eventually create a, an immortal species, which, which raises many other concerns, many other concerns, which I won't delve into right now, but I will in future podcasts, and I have done in previous podcasts. Um, <laughs> Graham Nesbitt, um, at Biggest Nizzy, one short sentence, it could be a laugh. It could be, could be a laugh. Not getting lots of horrendous diseases would certainly cheer me right up. <laughs> uh, okay, so at um, DK Large 2, gene therapy, um, a significant advance for treating children who are born with a genetic condition such as cystic fibrosis. Embryo engineering smacks of eugenics, that there is a perfect human being, that people with disabilities are not valued, hugely important to get their views. I think that's why a lot of people are afraid of both um, genetic engineering generally and um, even um, embryo selection. Uh, it's this, this idea of eugenics. Genetic engineering seems in many people's minds to be interwoven and tied up with the idea of eugenics, of selective breeding, of creating a master race. Um, and I get that. Um, the eugenics movement was terrible and it led to um it led to the rise of a nazi party um lots of people were sterilized or killed um in the name of creating a perfect human individual perfect species um and that's wrong obviously and genetic engineering potentially could result in in eugenics if misused which is why it needs to be regulated tightly, it needs to be controlled. Ethics are important in any technology that has such a wide scope as genetic engineering does. We need to discuss this more and more and more, which is why I've produced this podcast. Um, okay, final, final tweet, and then I will sum up. Uh, so... Uh, John McDonnell at McDonnell JP. No issue with the technology or techniques. Plenty with the regulation of, access to, and purpose of any practical implication or application. Pretty much as with any fundamentally groundbreaking technology. I cannot argue with that in any way. So, we've... Um, We've had a lot of opinions voiced um, in this podcast. Um, I can kind of sum up now um, the main ideas, the main fears um, that were raised. Basically, a lot of people are afraid that genetic engineering will be misused, either deliberately or accidentally. Um, the main concern is that uh, the use of genetic engineering will will result in a separation of humanity into separate castes, almost separate species. Um, the genetically engineered master race, who live for centuries, suffer few diseases, are intelligent, strong, and end up accumulating all of the power and wealth. Whilst the unmodified become a kind of underclass with less opportunities, more disease, shorter lifespans. That is a real concern, a real fear. And if the regulation is not sufficient and international, then that could happen. That could happen. But it doesn't have to happen. If the regulation is strong, robust, and internationally respected, and if this technology is available not just to the rich, I know that's easier said than done, 
But if it's not just available to the rich, and it may not just be available to the rich, you know, because yes, it will be expensive when it first comes out, but technologies tend to get cheaper over time. As new methods, new auto, new methods of automation come into play, etc., etc., things become cheaper. The early computers were weak. They could do very little. And they were huge. And they cost millions and millions. Now we all have a computer that's incredibly powerful in the palm of our hands for most of the day. Um, if IT can become cheaper and available to all, then perhaps genetic engineering will over time become cheaper and available to all. At which point, this idea of, of humanity separating into separate classes, separate castes, um, becomes moot. Um, so yeah, so I'm hopeful regarding that. Um, with the right regulation and improvements in the technology, um, then yes, this could be available to everyone and we wouldn't necessarily have to deal with the consequences of a genetic caste system. But there's not just that. There is also the idea that we might accidentally cause harm to our genomes. Scientists manipulating the genome could cause un unexpected consequences we could we could sterilize our species accidentally we could create disease we could create all sorts of problems but that's why science has the method it does um, we have a peer review process science is regulated before medications um, drugs etc techniques are made available in a clinical setting years and years of research needs to be performed many papers need to be published and then regulations need to be um, need to be made. So we have a process to try to prevent negative consequences um, of genetic engineering, and hopefully that process will um, prevent anything too damaging from occurring as gene therapy progresses. Of course, there will probably be mistakes. You know, drugs have been released. Um, into clinics, thalidomide springs to mind, um, as an example, that have caused harm. Um, but then those drugs get withdrawn and new drugs are developed. And hopefully that would be the case with genetic engineering. Regarding the other major concern that people expressed, that we'd somehow be playing God, uh, we would be interfering with nature. I get that some people have that viewpoint and I respect it, but as an atheist, I don't believe in God, so that point doesn't bother me. And as a scientist, I realise that nature has made many mistakes in the past. Um, there are a lot of horrible creations that have resulted in nature. There are, there are creatures, there are wasps that lay eggs in various insects that eat the insect alive. There are all sorts of viruses and diseases. Nature is full of horror and full of nastiness. Um, life on this planet for many species is, is short and violent and painful. Um, so I'm all for taking the reins of nature if we do it responsibly and if we do it ethically. So with that said, I think it's about time I ended this podcast. Um, it's been quite a long one again. Um, I should really work on creating shorter podcasts. They're always a bit of a marathon, but I just can't help it. Once I start talking, I do tend to find it difficult to stop, let's just say. <laughs> um, I hope you've enjoyed today's podcast. Um, if you have enjoyed the podcast, then I recommend listening to some of my other podcast episodes. There are now a total of, I believe, about 13 or so to choose from, covering all sorts of topics from stem cell research to religion to consciousness to memory. Um, so there should be something there for pretty much everyone. Um, if you would like to know a little bit more about me or about um, my podcast, then you can visit scienceontheedge.com or you can follow me on Twitter. My Twitter handle is at Mark of the D. That's M-A-R-K-O-F-T-H-E capital D. So that's all for now. Um, have a great day and I look forward to speaking to you again soon.